Um, anyway, we know this is what you all were waiting for. Uh, and so to begin, we'd like to do a couple things. Uh, number one is we're not just going to talk about esports, though we are going to begin with it. Uh, Kevin is one of those people in rarefied air, not just because he likes to oil paint um, and fly in fancy jets, but also because he sees a lot of the nexus between premium content, UGC, new technologies, old technologies, so forth and so on. Um, but to begin, Kevin, we want to start out with the esports space. Wait, wait, wait. We have some videos. Oh, we have some videos. I brought some videos. I'm so sorry. Uh, so I, who knows what Twitch is, actually? Who's, who's super familiar with Twitch? OK, good. We have videos for that. All right, cue first video. Ladies and gentlemen, rock and roll. I just want to tweet that we've switched over to Forza. And thanks to Taco Bell, we now have our savior, the AM Crunch Wrap. If any of you guys have not played Forza Horizon 2, you're missing out! Hey, we're The Race, the team that races to max prestige every year on Twitch when the new Call of Duty launches. No! <laughs> That's what I do at the club, I do the club to play. Things are all the good, <laughs> but they are. So just a little teaser as to what we do. Uh, we're a live video platform for gamers. People stream themselves playing games. People watch them. The streamers make money doing that. Uh, as uh, Johnson mentioned earlier, some of them are making millions of dollars a year. Uh, we're branching out of gaming a little bit. Um, so I've got a few more videos that um, uh, I think they wanted me to run through sort of how we engage with brands, but also what, what types of content kind of work in this, this format that, that we call uh, live social video. Uh, so this next video, I have to remember, is Chinese um, an eSports video. So we're going to talk a little bit about eSports. I know there have been a couple other panels, but uh, this is an oldie but goodie. It's, it's called The Play. Uh, this was a Dota, Dota 2 tournament uh, from 2012 in Benaroy Hall in Seattle, about 2,000 people in the audience, uh, and this epic moment happens, uh, and you'll see the crowd reaction. Uh, so cue video. Wrap around gank is going to be the name of the game for IG. Who leads the way? I believe it should be Zo. They're going to cut for the, the shorter path. They storm up the river. Patience from Zo. Waiting in the wing. Navi is about to be caught. Oh, there's the sleep. The surge. He catches everyone. Oh, this could be a total disaster. Thank you, man. Ravage on everyone. The black hole as well. Light of heaven turns it around. Ravage as well. Stolen by Denny. Are you kidding me? They turn it around. Four heroes dead. Four Five IG. heroes dead. Chuan trying to survive. Chuan it's gonna go down. Puppy talked about the Naga counter. It's Light of Heaven with his BKB. They turn it around. I don't even know how they're gonna do it. Standing ovation from the crowd. The last tower will be going down. And I think they sense blood in the water. They'll keep going. 10 and 3 is the score right now. No turning back. Wards are coming up cooldown in just 11 seconds. And here we go. This tower, this racks even, not long for life. So that's just one sample of esports. These days, they're filling stadiums to the tune of 50,000. I think one, one really fun fact uh, uh, about League of Legends in particular is they actually break Ticketmaster every time they, they release their tickets. They sell out in, you know, seconds, basically, uh, which, is, which, is, which is pretty nifty. OK, so uh, like I said, we're trying to do things. We'll, we'll expand on this a little bit later. Uh, next video is uh, a, an example of how we've been engaging with TV companies. So uh, we've worked with the Netflix and, and, and Amazons, of course, of the world um, on debuting shows on Twitch. They want to reach this millennial audience. Uh, but we like to have fun with the platform. We try to find things that might be interesting for our audience. Uh, and we did this uh, hilarious thing with Bob Ross, where we showed every episode front to back uh, of, of the joy of painting. Next video, please. I hope I got this right. Yes. Live in here. So as you see, there. it's just the old show. 
And what's really interesting about Bob Ross, so we used Bob Ross to launch uh, Twitch Creative, which is a vertical uh, that it was our first adjacency, which was just allowing people to stream uh, the process of creation, right? Their art, their music, uh, whatever they're interested in, uh, whatever hobby they have, you can now share that. And you'll see the chat is absolutely crazy. This was the finale. People were crying. Uh, 100, 120,000 people ended up watching it concurrently. 5.6 million, 5 million people watched it in, in some. And every Monday we have Bob Ross Mondays and, and a million people tune in for Bob Ross. This is 30-year-old content that this generation didn't even know existed. And they're now Bob Ross means that, that pervade the internet. Um, <laughs> another thing we did, we tried music. So we've done a few music things. We've streamed Ultra Music Festival, we've streamed EDC, we've streamed a few concerts, some album releases. Uh, this is one fun example that we did with Stevie Aoki uh, during his uh, last album release in 2014. Um, he probably had an album since then. But it was at his concert in Pasha, and you'll see how the chat reacts. And this is what I mean by interact. This is live social, social, social being interactive. Chat is almost as much of the content, as you saw in the Val Ross example, uh, as the content itself. Video, please. So you see, they invented this emoticon that's like this little dance emoticon. And it makes it feel like the audience, online audience is almost there in the crowd. This video doesn't have some of the shots, but they actually put a camera right on the DJ booth that Aoki would look into every now and then and basically dance for the online audience and, and actually sort of play with them. Uh, so there's lots of different flexible ways to do this, and that's something I think that's very unique for our platform is this type of interaction. The community just, they eat this up. They love it. They love to just find a piece of content and turn it into something that's their own. Um, so then uh, skip forward to just a few brand examples. So this is just a sizzle reel of the types of activations that we've done. And then I've got two specific examples. Not too many more videos, so bear with me. It's about another minute and a half. This is going to be the craziest Madden stream ever. This is impossible. <laughs> this is kind of a dream come true for me. I had a blast. I learned so much. That was really cool. I got popcorn. Oh. I got popcorn. Oh. Let's go! <laughs> oh, we're going to get wrecked. Everything this is the people. most successful party I've ever thrown in my entire life. We've been partying hard for several days. Twitch is teaming up with Amp Energy to keep summer going with an exclusive Twitch purple can. Oh, oh, oh my god! Oh my god, oh my dude! God. Um. Gives you the energy you need to take a game to the next level. How would you like a PlayStation VR for just $5? A mission to save the tacos. And you're watching the Magnificent Seven Counter-Strike Showdown right here on Twitch. This <laughs> is the 2016 HBO Men Heroes of the Storm Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I can keep going. Hey, do you guys like video games? <laughs> this game, dude. So you can see we try to have a lot of fun with campaigns and really bring brands in uh, in as authentic a way as possible. Next video is uh, an Old Spice campaign called uh, Nature, uh, uh, Nature Adventure. Uh, so it was inspired by this phenomenon that happened on Twitch called Twitch Space Pokemon, where, long story short, uh, they plugged in this old Game Boy uh, game, Pokemon Red, from like the 1990s, and uh, thousands of people were playing together, like a single player game. It was complete chaos, uh, but it was a first example of people actually playing together as an audience, which has now uh, really elicited a new paradigm in game development. So, and this one in a, uh, actually won an award, so go ahead, please. So as you can see, we, it's, it's a flexible platform, right? Uh, here's another example uh, that we do with Totino's Bucking Couch, where they put uh, players and pers uh, pro players and personalities on literally a couch that moves uh, while they're playing a game together. All right, last video. And now, League of Legends on the Totino's Bucking Couch. All right, let's go. Oh no, already? <laughs> oh no, not like this. <laughs> this is not okay. No, I almost did. No. <laughs> oh, f. <laughs> All right, let the panel begin. No, everyone knows what Twitch is. A round of applause. Hopefully, that made sense. I figured video was a good way to show you guys. 
I think one of the big takeaways there, though, Kev, and, and something that others have been saying is that uh, even though Twitch started out as an esports platform, it's clearly not just an esports platform, right? Yeah. Um, that being said, why don't we begin with the esports space? So um, I know something you wanted to share is, can you just share with us how large the esports space is, period? Sure. So there's lots of estimates, uh, many different uh, research groups that cover esports from Deloitte to Nuzu to Superdata. Rough range 2017 estimates are between 400 and 1.2. $2 billion in revenue, uh, between 100 and 150 million global uniques. Uh, it's a very wide range, as you can tell, uh, but it's fast growing. I mean, there's no, there's no doubting that. And the amount of investment that are coming, that's coming into the space from both game companies that are investing in their own esports programs to now sports team owners uh, and, and media industry titans that are coming in and buying teams. So Robert Kraft's come in, Cronkies uh, uh, Group has come in, uh, Sacramento Kings with Andy Miller, uh, Kevin Chow, founder, founder of Kabam. Like these guys are buying into uh, programs like the Overwatch uh, League, which are the first time in esports history, now esports has really been around for over 15 years, uh, that are franchise spots, as in they're safe, they're secure, they're guaranteed to be in the league and branded and, and, and with, with solid rules and regulations, but they're paying you know, $20 million a slot. LCS uh, North America, uh, 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 Riot's league, is now doing franchising as well to the tune of $10 million a slot. So it's getting very expensive to enter the space, um, but a lot of people's opinion is that, you know, given the revenue and given the revenue per, per audience member, uh, that it's a uh, it's really high value investment right now. Given, uh, given that you sit at the, the real epicenter of the entire space, where are the richest pockets of investment opportunities for esports right now? Yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, there, uh, you know, Silicon Valley will tell you find the platforms. Uh, there are many facets of the platform uh, uh, slice of the ecosystem that are available uh, for sort of disruption, so to speak. There's a lot of tournament platforms that, that have been invested in, uh, like Faceit, um, like Battlefy. Uh, Battlefy was invested in by WME. Uh, there's uh, uh, coaching software. A lot of people are going for coaching software. Team management software is really lacking in the space. Uh, just imagine, I mean, most teams are managing their, their players, their schedules on Google Docs, basically. Right, scouting is really difficult. A lot of people scout very randomly uh, just by playing on, on ladder online. Um, and then there's tournament organizers. There's teams. I think right now most of the money's going into teams. A lot of people, of course, want to find game companies. Game, you know, gaming games as content are seen as very high risk investments generally. Uh, but you're starting to see uh, people willing willing to take a bet, particularly on um, you know second second or serial. Uh, entrepreneur, game developers, because that's the ultimate prize, right? You get a game uh, that, that can hit that esports uh, audience and, and grow that way. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made there. I mean, recently, just this game called uh, Player Unknown Battlegrounds, a game um, uh, by this company called Blue Hole in Korea, which is like a free for all uh, shooter that's a survival shooter. So imagine. It's like a Hunger Games. You get dropped into this world. You have to look, go loot, find armor, find weapons, find bandages, and then uh, it's last, like a last man standing game or last team standing game uh, that went from zero to you know 10 million players in in barely three months. So if you can if you can nail it, great. Games you know hard but best in terms of very fast equity growth. Uh, right now though, yeah, I say teams is where it's mostly going. And on the other side of the spectrum, what's overstated uh, in its value or what's frothy right now? Oh. <laughs> Besides, I mean, the whole industry is a little, I, honestly, it's honestly. all a little frothy, right? I, there's not a lot of revenue. You, you, you see, like, as, as much as being, is being invested in the space, the revenue is really not quite there yet. And, and a lot of these estimates, we have our own internal estimates uh, for each part of the ecosystem. It, it's, it's getting there, right? A lot of people are relying on, on licensing and, and sponsorships for the most part. Uh, merchandise is not quite yet mature. There's no infrastructure for ticket sales, right, for events. They're just sort of renting space periodically throughout the world. Um, there's not really sort of solid, repetitive, uh, uh, scaled income yet uh, for, for a lot of the parts of the ecosystem. Uh, that said, game companies are making a lot of money. I mean, Overwatch is, is, is clearing close to a billion. Overwatch, uh, Hearthstone clears over a billion. League, uh, Dota, I mean, they all are making hundreds of, hundreds of millions, if not billions. So at the top of the funnel, there's a lot of money coming in from the players spending in game. But in the rare case, uh, people aren't seeing that money, really. Dota, is a, Dota and, and League have adopted this recently, and, and increasingly more game companies are adopting this concept called the compendium, which is uh, uh, invented by Valve. This is why uh, the Dota prize pool is so big. So basically, they create an in-game item it, uh, that costs 10 bucks, and you buy it, and 25% uh, of that 
payment goes to the price pool. So Valve is selling, this, this year's price pool is almost $25 million, right? Uh, so the, the pro players that won walked away with almost $3 million each. Uh, but the Valve is making basically $100 million on that item and then donating, so to speak, $25 million to the price pool. That doesn't happen in every game. Not every game is big enough to have that level of transaction that can feed into the ecosystem or, or have the margins uh, because maybe they're not as experienced as a company to, to, to feed that ecosystem. But people are definitely experimenting with different commercial options. It's just, it's getting there, right? Uh, it's getting there. But, you know, it's, it's still very expensive. It's, it, a lot of people are investing in... Uh, you know, really young entrepreneurs, which is obviously great, and that's sort of the spirit of, of what we do in Silicon Valley and, and all around the world, obviously, but you got to be really smart about it um, uh, and, and really understand the industry. A lot of people come in thinking, oh, well, I know sports, I know entertainment, I know this. It's very different. Esports is a digitally native sport. It's the first digitally native competitive spectator experience uh, that, 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 uh, uh, ever, right? And uh, a lot of people don't understand how different that is. Let's talk about the players a little bit. So th there's been a lot of conversation across all the big platforms of who is going to embrace and really elevate the next generation of influencers or creators, as it were, right? Uh, and a lot of people in the industry think increasingly less is going to be one of the entrenched incumbents and more like one of the platforms that already have a nice foothold on a certain community but are going to expand from there, like the Twitches, like the Instagrams, like the Pinterest of the world, like Spotify. Um, how does Twitch think about the next generation of influencers, players, creators? And what are the what are the sort of ripest opportunities that you see to support them in the space? Yeah, uh, so we're, you know, one of our company values, which is funny, we never really wrote these down before we got acquired, but now we have them written down. And uh, it's creators company. first. Yes, go corporate. Um, it's creators first. So we've always been about creators. Uh, that's really what started Twitch. We, we were originally just in TV, gen, a very generalist live streaming platform, never talked to our users. We kind of assumed that we were our users and kind of built things that we thought were smart. Uh, they weren't. And we finally started talking to creators. Well, StarCraft 2 came out, we were obsessed. We started talking to StarCraft 2 pro players, which was like a dream for us, like those conversations were just a joy. But we learned a lot about what they needed, right? They needed to make money, they needed certain, tech, uh, certain technical things that we could put on the server side so that they didn't have to run it off of their computer. And from there, we built Twitch. Um, so we, you know, from a commercialization standpoint, we're always trying to offer more choice. It's, it's a free platform, it's free to stream, you don't have to, run ads if you don't want to. You don't have to run subscriptions if you don't want to. Um, but of the two million streamers every month, uh, we have about 20,000 that are partnered. And so uh, partnered streamers are, there's quantitative and qualitative uh, application process for them. And then they can turn on ads, they can turn on subscriptions, they can turn on what we call bits, uh, which is our sort of virtual good mechanism that people use as a, a tipping mechanic. Uh, and then we have uh, game sales, where you earn a, a fee from game sales that you sell on Twitch. There's merch by Amazon. There's all this stuff we've integrated that are different revenue streams. So we're trying to always expand on that. One thing that I didn't mention is, is sponsorships and influencer programs. So we work with a lot of brands. They want to come in. They want to know how to reach this audience authentically, work with the creators authentically. Um, so we're trying to you know, sort of productize that, so to speak. Um, but we are always trying to think of more, right? If, you, if you're a streamer and you don't like ads, you don't have to do that. You can design your show however you want uh, with different commercialization options. So that's, that's the way we think about it. And obviously, we've been focused on games. We're trying to expand out of that. Um, we have some really good early case studies from uh, the creative community, uh, from the, the, what we call the IRL community the, uh, category on the site, which is basically vlogging, uh, mobile broadcasting, uh, and increasingly more. So we're, we're constantly trying to, to uh, evolve that. And, uh, on the flip side, trying to figure out better promotional mechanisms, better streaming tools to make it easier. Um, uh, training, we offer uh, uh, press training and brand safety training, particularly for those influencers that I mentioned earlier. Um, so we're trying, trying to expand. Let's talk about the brand piece a little bit. There's a misperception among a lot of advertisers that some segments of esports isn't brand safe. But clearly all, in a multitude of ways, with a multitude of brands have been very successful there. So to the brands in the audience, how should they think about esports in general? And then how should they think about uh, branded opportunities on the Twitch platform? Yeah, it's a good, tough question. I mean, there's a lot of different games, right? So a lot of folks go after just the big games. They might not realize that, you know, the game communities are quite different. Uh, I'll use the fighting game community as an example. It's a really fervent community. Uh, I wish I had a video, because the crowd there just, it's, it's, it's super zealous and very authentic. And what's really interesting about that community in particular is how diverse it is. Uh, it's people from all over the world that come. There's one, one event in Vegas every year called Evo. 10,000 people come. The majority of them are actually playing in a tournament. These fighting games are games like Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, um, uh, Tekken. Uh, and so on, and it's a really cool crowd. It's young, it's old, it's, it's multiracial, 
uh, and it's just really fun. And you might have a brand that resonates with that better than a brand that, re uh, that resonates with a game like, uh, let's say, Dota. Dota is much more Eastern European and uh, Chinese audience, right? So you really have to talk with the group that you're working with, it, whether it's Twitch, whether it's a tournament organizer, whether it's a game company, and really truly understand what their audience actually looks like before you should make a decision. Beyond that, then, it's just figuring out you know, how do you want to approach it, all, all the usual rubric you go through to, to think about you know, how do you design the creative, what talent do you bring on. Um, but you know, the good thing is a lot of us has, have learned a lot along the way. So whether it's a game company or a platform, uh, you know, if they're doing you right, they're kind of hand-holding you through that process and making sure you're thinking through all the right things. Something that uh, we talked to uh, Bohan earlier of Twitter about um, is that every big platform, whether it's Amazon and the Amazon Studios level or Apple or Facebook or YouTube and so forth, are moving up market to more premium content, as it were. Uh, I know this is something you personally care about as well. How does Twitch think about premium content, whether it's original license or from the crowd? I think the fundamental difference that uh, I realize, what we realized uh, about Twitch is we're appointment viewing. And there's this whole generation of kids that are growing up that don't know what that means. They don't know what it feels like to sit on a couch with your family or your friends and tune in at the same time and then go to work or class the next day and, and talk about it. it. It doesn't really happen anymore. There are some exceptions. I think HBO is particularly good at this with Game of Thrones and shows like Westworld. But you don't really get that. Like, I loved House of Cards, but I'm still on season four and I can't talk to anybody about it, right? Not that I always watched every series you know, in time when it was on television, but we can bring that back. And it's more fun. There's a lot, all this weird stuff you can do right, uh, uh, around, around Twitch with, with chat, with extensions, which are sort of overlays over the video. You can have a lot of fun with the content. Um, so like I said, we've been testing mostly with old content and, and some premieres. Um, and we try to su do some of our own shows right, to test those adjacencies. We have a sneaker culture show called Fresh Stock that uh, our, our team internally does. We have another show called Fanboys, which is just about like gaming, but also comics and movies and, and, and other sort of geek culture, so to speak. Uh, so we're testing that stuff, but I'd love to see things. I, I blabbed earlier this year at a, at a conference about like a choose your own adventure style live show. Like, could you make a show that feasibly the audience can basically control, that feels premium, feels scripted, um, but is actually controlled by the audience? Uh, can you take this live format with that audience interactivity and append it to a dance competition. Or, uh, well, actually, we, just, we recently streamed the uh, beard and mustache competition, which I didn't know was a thing. Um, so, like, stuff like that, you know. Please elaborate I, 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 on what this is. Well, I, you know, I, I'll be honest, I didn't, I didn't catch it. I forget where I was. I really wanted to watch it. I think it was just people with beards and mustaches looking at each other, maybe somewhat threateningly. Sounds right. I don't know. And then shaving. And then someone won a prize. Um, Sounds right. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, it's, it's that kind of stuff. Now, if we had a great series that we could debut every week at the same time, that would be awesome. You know, right? That, that tune-in effect uh, is, I think, what angle we should take because it's very unique. It's supplementary, uh, or complementary, I should say, to a lot of the current business models, like particularly the SVOD model. Uh, certainly complementary to the AVOD model because obviously you could just, you know, just the whole purpose of, of the premiere, uh, the premiere, the tune-in, would be to drive, uh, you know, sort of cultural think right around it, uh, that that virality. So I think that's that's the approach we want to take. Um, but I think it'll work for all different types of content, as we've seen with 30-year-old content, you know. Legacy Media has tried for years to make their content more interactive, right? 3D was, was sort of the biggest botch of this, right? Uh, that may be premature, but it was the biggest botch of it, right? When you look forward to the next three to five years, what codifies the best interactive storytelling? What are the, what are, mm -hmm. If you were to say crystal ball, what are the three types of interactive storytelling that you say agnostic of a Twitch will thrive? Three types of interactive storytelling. Um, I mean, I think AR is super interesting. Uh, again, I think, you know, with the interactive, it, I don't know, I think about interactive in many different ways, right? Um, but let's say, like, the actual, like, sort of contrib contribution to the content side of things, I think it's, there's enough information out there where you can alter shows. Um, you know, people, you know, a lot of people, during Lost in particular, were wondering, oh, is this actually, is this actually getting altered by online chatter? And, and people, <laughs> people theorize a lot about uh, many shows that way. Mm. Um, but I think AR is super interesting, especially now with the new iPhone announcement and how easy it is to do that. Um, it, it's, it's pretty cool uh, what you can do there in terms of storytelling in your daily life. Uh, VR, you know, ebbs and flows for me, honestly. I think there's, uh, it's settled down a little bit. Um, but the cool thing about VR is, uh, it, it is, uh, Chris Milk said this best, I think. It's the empathy engine, right? You can actually jump in, feel like you're somewhere, feel like you're participating in, 
you know, uh, a campfire next to a village that they're, you know, and, and, and they're storytelling. I think that's really, really cool. I think it's a long ways away. Um, but I, you know, I, I am excited about uh, generally all the interest in live video online between us, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. They're all different takes on it, all different angles, all different types of interactivity. Um, so in general, I'm just excited to see how people really latch onto that. Got it. Uh, let's change uh, gears a little bit. Um, you don't sleep. I know this. Eh. Kevin sleeps about three hours a night. Or what? Four hours. Pretty good, right? Generously. Uh, what keeps you up at night? Uh, Besides your dog. Well, this barking dog uh, sometimes, uh, and poor sleep hygiene in general, and that like my windows aren't actually covered by shades very effectively. Oh. Anyway, the stuff that keeps me up at night. I, you know, I think about this stuff a lot, right? And, and I particularly think about the intersection of all the different things that we do. I mean. It's funny, you know, you come to a conference like this and there's so many interesting people, so many cool conversations we have, and, you know, we look at it, it's music, it's sports, it's entertainment, then there's digital, there's traditional, uh, there's all these other things that you can, you know, sort of carve up the industry with, but if you think about as a consumer, when I play games, I listen to music, right? When I read, I listen to music. Uh, um, when I'm watching TV, I might be, you know, playing a game these days on my mobile phone. So it's, it's, it all kind of crosses over. Uh, and so there's all these intersections that, that, that we think about. And, and I think the thing I think about most these days is, you know, particularly now that we're part of Amazon, uh, they've got Amazon Music, they've got Prime Video, like what could we do with them? So the Prime Video example I talked uh, ad nauseum about already, but music, uh, one of the most asked questions in chat historically has been, what song is this? And what I realized from that is actually each of our channels, we have about 30, 40,000 channels live any given moment, uh, is they're DJs. They're basically radio, right? People want to know what they're listening to. Sometimes people tune into a channel. They'll leave a channel if they don't like the music. Um, and so what can we do with that? How do we leverage that as an opportunity for promoting up and coming artists uh, uh, and so on? And I know there's a lot of companies, I, I met one company here called Herdwell that is sort of tackling that exact problem. Um, so there's things like that that I think about. Uh, uh, otherwise, I just think about, you know, I don't the stars know. and the how stars. they count. Yeah. The sheep. 